Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Non-League Weekly. I'm your host, Amos Murphy, and this is your new non-league podcast sponsored by betting.co.uk, brought to you by the people of Non-League Daily. I'm once again joined by two esteemed guests, non-league experts themselves. I've got Joel with me. Joel, how yeah, are you? Yeah, yeah, very well. Looking forward to um, get, getting stuck into another interesting week of, of non-league action. And I've got Richard, who last week, those who listened along, will be able to remember Richard saying who knows what state non-league football will be in this time in seven days' time. But it's been an interesting week. I won't say it's necessarily been as eventful as the ones we've had in the previous couple of weeks, but it's been an interesting one nonetheless. It certainly has. I mean, as I said last week, you never get a quiet week in non-league football. You can look at the uh, Zuma situation at Dagenham, mm. uh, Chaman Guron, Saturday, FA Trophy success, success for teams and disappointment. You know, I think we could all deserve a quiet quiet week in non-league football. But then we won't have anything to talk about. And to be honest, I'd rather it be that way. And, you know, we could all have a rest come end of season, May, June time, when football has yeah. come to an end. Yeah, exactly. It would be rude not to start with the Johan Zuma thing, Joel. Whilst we've got you here, obviously, for those that can see along with the video, Joel is donning a quite fantastic Dagenham and Redbridge hoodie. But, Joel, what has it been like as a Dagenham fan in the last seven days? Obviously, his brother Kurt has stole the headlines, but Dagenham have taken a little bit of a different route. Now, we'll be careful what we say. Obviously, it's a, it's an ongoing investigation. But just in terms of in and around the club, What's it been like being sort of focus of a, a worldwide news story? Yeah, it feels like the club's been thrust into a really quite horrific story and the club are synonymous with it now through no fault of their own. There's been a weird feeling around the club. There was a little bit of a weird feeling about it yesterday. You could almost feel that the energy of a lot of people had been zapped and it was all people were really talking about before the game. So it, it was a strange one. Um, the club have probably taken the sensible route considering the backlash they would have got if they hadn't. Obviously, that triggers a debate on kind of where clubs should stand on on moral, morally reprehensible actions anyway. And you can pinpoint other examples where maybe there should have been harsher punishments and therefore whether this one kind of aligns with that. But at the end of the day, the club have done what they think is the sensible decision and can't really criticise them for that. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, you know, Dagenham are no small club in the grand scheme of things, but when compared to West Ham United, it is astonishing really given the, the differences in the in the way the two have handled situations. Obviously, West Ham went ahead and played Kurt Zuma the day after the story broke, which caused plenty of uproar on social media and, and granted who knows what Dagenham would have done if they had a midweek game they didn't they had some time to mull over it and came to the decision to suspend him until further investigations Richard then let, let's kick things off let's move away from that situation that pretty horrific situation and move towards what has been an eventful week like I said in the world of non-league and our starting point for part one today is going to be Mr Paul Cook an esteemed manager, a fantastic football league manager during his time, during his career. And he's ended up in the fifth tier of English football. He's, he's dropped down into, into witty old non-league, Mr Cook himself. He's back at Chesterfield. What were your sort of feelings around his appointment when it was announced on on Thursday afternoon, I think it was actually, when it when it officially came after after much speculation from the from the famous Chesterfield admin on Twitter? Yeah, it was a bizarre one for me because if you remember in last week's podcast, I said, you know, uh, Cook had turned down the jobs almost seemingly before Rowe departed uh, the Ch- uh, Chesterfield. And I said they need to take their time and get the right f- appointment. They certainly seem on paper to have got the right appointment. It's another big name in non-league football to go to with the likes of Phil Parkinson, Dave Challoner and a couple of others, which is a which is what Chesterfield need. But I think if you go back to when Paul Cook was there, when he got him into the League One playoffs back in 2015, when they lost to, I think it was Preston North End. Yeah, Preston you, went on to win. Yeah. You, you wouldn't have thought that seven years down the line that Chesterfield would be a non-league football club and been here for a few seasons now, and that their manager would be Paul Cook, who's who'd left. 
and has come back. So it's bizarre on that side, but it, it could potentially be an inspired appointment by Chesterfield. It could you know, be that little spark that brings the fans in, reunites everyone and gets the team playing uh, and pushing for Stockport all the way for that one automatic promotion place. Yeah, it, it was definitely interesting. I know um, Liam Narcliffe in the Derbyshire Times done fantastic reporting mm. over the last seven days of the situation there and, and even extending that into into when the news broke about James Rowe. But his sort of, the, the word coming out of Chesterfield originally was that they weren't able to um, sort of agree personal terms and it looks as if they were going to have to be forced to look elsewhere. It's turned out this week that it wasn't to our knowledge last week on last week's episode, but it's turned out this week Pete Wilde rejected the Chesterfield job, whereas at first it looked as if he'd just sort of not entertained it at all, but he, he, he actually, you know, he did accept uh, some sort of talks and, and something went on there, but it turns out he, he said no and, and looks and maybe signed a new contract with Halifax. Still wait to see what goes on there, but yeah, Paul Cook is, is a fantastic appointment for Chesterfield. There was lots of excitement, wasn't there, Joel? On Thursday afternoon, it came on the back of a, of a, a point away at Stockport County, a game where they maybe should have won and, and we'll come on to the sort of results they've had so far a little bit later on, but did it feel for you when that appointment was made that this is perhaps advantage Chesterfield in the title race or did you still think that they were sort of coming into it as underdogs despite having an esteemed League One, League Two manager? I've thought for a few weeks that Stockport would be the ones who would go on and win the league. But after seeing that Paul Cook appointment, it, it does have a wow factor. You know, this is a man who has won promotion with, with Chesterfield, with Portsmouth. He masterminded that famous um, Wigan Cup run where they beat Man City. So this is a man who shouldn't be in non-league. Obviously, no disrespect to non-league, but he's just a football league manager. So it's reinvigorated the club after that bleak period where the whole James Rowe saga was ongoing. Obviously, after the events of yesterday, that would have been diluted significantly, but I'm sure we'll get into that later. It's certainly an appointment that would inject a lot of life into Chesterfield and really kind of give them a boost ahead of the um, the title battle that is unfolding. But for me, Stockport, um, Stockport are the ones to beat for sure and, and I don't think anyone will beat them, but certainly Chesterfield have given themselves a strong chance by their recent results and this outstanding appointment. In his opening interview as Chesterfield boss, Paul Cook actually did say, you know, I, I couldn't have gone to another National League club. Um, I don't think he was doing much disrespect to, to the teams in the National League there. Like we say, his stock is much higher than the fifth tier. But obviously that connection with Chesterfield, which is something, again, we discussed last week, already being established and, and coming back in as, as a hero, basically. You know, like we mentioned there, Richard, he was one game away essentially, from, from taking them to the, the championship it would have been an incredible feat even then. Mm -hmm. Since they've dropped into 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 non-league and, and perhaps before James Rowe came in, there was a suggestion they could potentially even go into the National League North. Things weren't looking fantastic for them. But in terms of where we are now, Paul Cook announced on the Thursday it came after the 2-2 draw away to Stockport County in a game they won. Uh, they were leading 2-0, sorry. That took us to Weymouth on Saturday when the feeling before the game heading into, and into the match was that Chesterfield were going to walk over a Weymouth, a team that threatened by relegation. They've not had the best of seasons. New manager has come in and, and they've sort of had renewed optimism slightly, but results haven't always matched where they've wanted to be. It seemed, didn't it, until around 80 minutes or so that Chesterfield were going to just have a comfortable 1-0 victory. They probably could have scored a couple more, but 1-0 probably wouldn't have been a, a, an unfair reflection of the scoreline. However, 98 minutes come along, Akeem Rose pops up with an equaliser for Weymouth, and it's a disastrous result in a week where they've already dropped points from leading positions. That's now four from winning positions. How costly do you think those will be for Chesterfield? I think... They'll be costly in some sense, but then you take a point at Stockport, you know, it's you've dropped two points there, but still a point at your title rivals and you've taken two points off them as well. I think the Weymouth draw will probably be more of a frustrating one of the two because, as you say, you expect to go to Weymouth and win with the position they're in. But against any relegation team in whatever level at this time of the season, it is going to be hard to 
teams are going to make it hard to come up against. I've seen two different teams in relegation battles in two of my last three games in different leagues, and they've both made it tough. You sit there, you think before again they're going to walk or walk over the other, be walked all over. But they certainly haven't. They've made it hard. They've taken leads. They've scored goals. So there's no such thing as an easy game. I know it's an old cliche, but it's true. And I think Chesterfield will be disappointed with the result. And I think had they not had that injury to Shimanga, I don't think they would have lost because they probably won't have been eight, eight, nine minutes yeah. of added time. And you know, you get to that point, the probably way more for them to score might have done. You know. Uh, if it was only, say, three minutes and they were throwing men forward more earlier on in injury time. But I think overall, I think Chesterfield fans coming away from Dorset yesterday will be frustrated about, the, as you say, the fact they've dropped uh, four points from two games in winning positions like that. Around 400 Spyrites fans made the trip to Dorset and... Like you say, they're going to be coming away frustrated there, but it's impossible for us not to speak about the incident involving Kabongo Shaminga. The main talking point, I reckon, from that game, Joel, is the is the disastrous, pretty pretty heartbreaking injury to their main man, who was, I think we can all agree, sort of club loyalties aside, rivalries aside, has delighted the National League this season and obviously coming in from Boring Wood last season. It wasn't a sort of hidden gem. We knew what we were going to get from him, but he's taken his game to the next level. In terms of the tackle itself, though, it was uh, Haji Monaga who, who made, the, who made the, the foul. It wasn't given as a, as a free kick even at the time, I don't believe. It definitely wasn't given as a card. We've watched that incident back. Where do you stand on that incident itself? Do you think it was a, a correct refereeing decision or do you think perhaps it may have warranted a red card? It's certainly a robust challenge. Nobody's denying that. Yeah. But at the same time, had the injury not happened, and it's one of them where you'd see 200 challenges like that across probably the National League, National League South, National League North, in any given weekend, you'd see so many of them and only one at most is going to end in really any sort of injury, let alone one of that severity. Had it not happened, there's no way, for example, people would be clipping that tackle, putting it on social media and calling it an outrageous tackle. It's only really because of what we know now with the injury that's followed that people are even talking about it in the context of should it have been a red card. I wouldn't have been surprised to see a yellow because of how, how firm it was and there is an element of, you know, it's it's forceful, it's not the best tackle you've ever seen, but at the same time, he's won the ball. The ball's flown in a quite um, quite clear trajectory in the opposite direction to, to which the Weymouth player came. So I think you have to just put it down as one of them where it's unfortunate. Obviously, the outcome's not desirable. Well, so, some clubs will, will obviously be happy that Shimanga's out, albeit not for the reasons that, that exist now. But again, just an unfortunate one. But then again, not a red card for me. I'm inclined to agree. I think having I've watched it many times, and we were just speaking actually that it's a shame that there aren't the angles that are accessible for for sort of like top European games, Premier League games that you can see a tackle from all different angles. Because from the one we've seen, which is is quite a high up, it's the sort of main camera angle for the game itself. It looked heavy like you say it looked robust but red card I, I don't I don't particularly think that had been the right decision which you know you look at the consequence of um of Shamanga's injury and I don't think it would be unfair given what has happened for a player to be sent off but at the same time I don't think it'd be particularly fair for for the challenge itself to be given as a red card because as Joel mentions there nine times out of ten up and down football be that the Premier League right down to the depth of non-league and, and amateur football itself tackles like that happen every week and nine times out of ten the play gets up and walks off so like we say we extend our sympathies to Shamanga it's it's a tragic injury a, a man who has been fantastic to watch this season just in midweek that goal against Stockport the, the opening goal for Chesterfield was was unbelievable and you know the it's it's unfortunate for Chesterfield because they've just got out the January transfer window where they think, oh, wow, well, we've kept Shamanga. This is this is it for us now. We can go on and push for the league. They then announce Paul Cook as manager and it looks as if that he's broken his leg and who knows when he's going to play again. 
Richard, in terms of Paul Cook's first sort of 72 hours in the job as Chesterfield manager, I'm not quite sure he could have predicted a worse outcome, especially, you know, we, we mentioned the games there, we mentioned the results, but they could have gone top with a victory. Stockport County were in FA Trophy action, which we'll come to a little bit later on. This was Chesterfield's game in hand. They're now level on points for County, and it doesn't look as if, at the moment, they've got an edge to get in front of the Hatters. No, absolutely not. I think you you said it was probably the worst start for a Chesterfield manager could make. Even I think even if they'd won yesterday, they got a second goal after the injury, or even were leading two 0 you lose your manga, and it takes a big, big part of the Chesterfield side, the big part from the Chesterfield side out of the equation. You've got other strikers like Danny Rose, Stephen Payne, uh, Nathan Tyson. They now need to step up and try and replace what Shamanga brought to the team. And it's going to be really hard for him because he brought so much to that side. And that is really the reason why I think Chesterfield are up there this season because of Shamanga. And as you say, the level on points with Stockport, there's a lot of football to be played between now and the end of the season. So it's anyone's guess is who's going to win the National League this season. So that makes it exciting, but I think if we'd be, I think if we Chesterfield and anyone, if we could have kept Shimanga fit and he was still playing, you know, it's going to make for a really exciting end to the uh, Vanarama National League season. I think now it could slightly change, and if Stockport can get a couple more victories, Chesterfield drop a couple potentially, then Stockport could have the potential of running away with the title. It's been a really difficult couple of weeks for for Chesterfield and just when you think they've got over that hill of sorting out the managerial issues a bombshell like this comes along it, it's 24 goals in 27 games league games for Shamanga this season which is an astonishing record it's almost a, ga- a goal every game and you take that out of the side and, and you look at the numbers and perhaps they're not in that sort of title mix we'll wait and see but if we look at a, little, uh, a few odds um, from Betfred in the state of the title race at the moment Stockport are, are obviously favourites at eight to eleven, Chesterfield coming at three to one, and Boreham Wood at thirteen to two. They're a name we haven't really mentioned in the title race, have we? Obviously, the delight in the world with their FA Cup exploits. Is that going to be a little bit of a problem for them, Joel? Do you think when we get into those sort of deeper months? Okay, let's put it this way. Last week we said that we think uh, Boreham Wood are going to get knocked out by by Bournemouth. Long, lo and behold, they go and they go and stun the Championship side. It will be surprised to see them go to Goodison Park and get a victory there. There, wouldn't it? But it could happen, and they may still be in the FA Cup by by a couple of weeks' time. Yet you think it's going to be all sort of hands on deck for the league title after the fifth round of the FA Cup? Yeah, definitely. Boreham Wood were not expected to win at Bournemouth, but then again, when they did, I wasn't particularly surprised overly because of how well they'd done in the competition previously. Everton probably will be a step too far, but no result at Goodison Park will discredit or disgrace what Garrard has has done again this season. So the only problem, if it is a problem, obviously it's a nice problem, I suppose, is that they now go to Goodison Park on a Thursday. They're then scheduled to actually play Dagenham on the Saturday. That will probably be moved to a Sunday. But it will be disruptive having those games, especially when they have an important game at the weekend to have the FA Cup. So it might hamper them but I'm sure they won't mind too much either way if it does, but mm-hmm. it's a once-in-a-lifetime game for their fans, I suppose. Indeed. Obviously, first non-league side to make it to the fifth round of the FA Cup since Lincoln City, actually, all those years ago under Danny Cowley, and you see what sort of what sort of benefit that can have for a, for a team in the National League and the sort of investment they've been able to make after that. So whether or not they go up this year, who knows? If they do, it will be definitely a plus in their sort of progression as a football club. We'll wait and see. Richard, then, we're going to do a little bit of predictions to to finish this sort of part <laughs> off. Three teams I've mentioned there. We're going to we're gonna put our necks on the line and say they're the three teams that are most likely to, to win the league. Uh, you know, Bromley are doing some good things, but it's unlikely they'll be able to bridge that gap. What do you see the National League one, two and three looking like come the end of the season? Yeah, I'll give you my predictions in a minute, but I just want to say, I think if uh, Bourne would don't go up this season, and I think a football league team's got to come in for Luke Garrard. The job he's done 
over the last few seasons. He got him to the playoff final, what, five years ago, now against Tranmere. He's consistently got him into the playoffs for a team of Boreham Wood's size. And they were mentioning it in the commentary last week about where they've come from, and he's had a big part to play in that. Then a football league team's got to surely come in and have a gamble mm-hmm. on him. But I think top three, I think it would be, I think it's going to be how the table is now, really. I think Stockport, with the quality they've got, the money they've got to bring in players, they've got the likes of Madden. I know John Rooney's just gone. We've got Elliot Newby, who was a star last season for Chile. He can't even get a game at the minute for Stockport. So if there's an injury there, he can slot in quite easily. Stockport, I think the loss of Shamanga is going to hamper them. And I think the FA Cup run's going to hamper Bourne and Wood. But I do think if the game was at Meadow Park, then I really do think we could have been seeing a lot tighter of a game at Bourne and Wood than, uh, than the game having to go to Goodison Park. Yeah, we wait and see what Bourne and Wood can do in the FA Cup. But for now, with attention on the National League, Joel, you're one, two and three. Are you sticking with Richard? Is it going to be as it is now? I think I'd have to go Stockport to win the league. I'm not wavering on that. Um, second, well, you'd say Chesterfield, but at the same time, the loss of Shamanga is going to be massive, so they could possibly slip down to third, even fourth. Third for me, probably a toss-up between Wrexham and, and Boreham Wood. Obviously, Wrexham have made a couple of signings okay. in January. It will be interesting to see how they affect the team, how they bolster them. But it's hard to not imagine Wrexham coming strong at the end of the season, considering the amount of Football League quality players and players who have played in the Football League in the past. When it gets to that period in the season where it's about endurance and where you have so many games, important games, Wrexham have those players who've played important games in the past. So at the minute, I'd probably say Wrexham will pick Boreham Wood and then you'll have the likes of Bromley, um, Halifax, to be fair. I really should mention them. They they will probably finish third or fourth as well. It's very it's very hard to say, but yeah, I'm going to yeah, say the quality is incredible. Genuinely. I completely forgot about FC Halifax yeah. Town as well, and Pete Wilde, the job he's done there. We mentioned it at the top that he could have been going to Chesterfield, but he, he wants to see the game uh, the season out with Halifax, and who knows, they could potentially uh, re-establish themselves in the promotion mix. But that will do for part one. We will be back with part two with an FA Trophy roundup and taking a look at the results from the National League. <laughs> So then, FA Trophy fifth round this weekend. It was down to the last 16 teams in the competition. There were some shocks. There were some results you would probably expect. And there were some absolute trouncings. But there is only one place to start. Dartford of the National League South. Nil. Needham Market of the Southern Premier Central League. Mouthful. One. Um... Richard, let, let's kick yes. things off with you then. Luke Ingram scored from the spot in the 73rd minute for Needham Market. Yes. This is this has got to be story of the weekend, doesn't it? It certainly has. What a result for Needham Market. And we always do in the FA Trophy get a team from step three or step four who go on an unbelievable run in the trophy. Mm. Chorley, I keep mentioning them, I do apologise. <laughs> FC, FC United of Manchester did it a few years ago. They got to quarterfinals, Nantwich Town got to the semi-finals 2016, Bognor Regis as well that year, uh, Hornchurch won it last season, there's always a great story and it's fantastic to see Needham Market get through and hopefully they can get a good draw in, Mon- in Mon- on Monday and a home draw will be fantastic for them, being at home, get the fans in, pack the place out and maybe could pull off another scalp and get into the semi-finals of the competition it really was fantastic and obviously there's no other way to follow these games than than just on twitter and whatnot and i was frantically scrolling through about what what would we have been about half past four looking for the result waiting for every update from the needham market um twitter account and and when it came through at full time a fantastic result and i don't think that the twitter admin tweeted for about another 
must have been about another hour. Um, I actually spoke to Kevin Harlock, the manager in midweek, and, and he explained the um, the less than quiet celebrations they had after the Yeovil game. Said that he, he woke up the next day with, with his head hurting a little bit, and, and I'm sure he woke up on Sunday morning feeling a little bit a little bit similar. Would they be able to go on and potentially threaten to lift the trophy themselves? Obviously, it would be an incredible shock, but there's precedent from beforehand that suggests maybe they could. It's going to be incredibly hard this season because I don't remember for a while there being that many National League teams in it. I think six of the eight are National League and at the upper echelons of the National League at that. So it will be incredibly tough for them to keep producing results. But at the same time, there's also nobody at this level that need a market will fear and they're just going to enjoy themselves because they didn't expect to be here and they've thoroughly earned the right. 100 percent and and when i had that chat with kevin that that's basically what he said um you know we, we're not going to fear anybody we want to be in the competition as much as we can and it's if i'm being honest i, I don't particularly think that he expected to to get a result against dartford obviously he said that he he wanted to he, he was adamant to go in there not just to make up the numbers but he, he was sort of bigging them up and saying how well they've been doing in in the national league south and his assistant manager went to, went to watch them in one of the midweek games and was just spellbound by how good they were but they've done a job on them and, and they've they've actually not conceded which which is crazy but yeah you mentioned you mentioned the the quality of team left in the competition. It, it, it is it is phenomenal. Joel, we'll stick with you then. You you at the game, I presume. Yeah, uh, on yeah. on Saturday for Dagenham and Redbridge against Spennymoor Town, two 0 victory for the Daggers over the National League North side. What was your assessment then of your team's performance there? Yeah, it wasn't the finest performance for sure. Um, Darren McMahon actually came out and said the first half was absolute rubbish. Um, to quote him. <laughs> But the second yeah. half, we managed to get an early goal before Spennymoor really had a t- had time to settle in the second half. And then um, they had a red card. Unfortunately, that came through a tackle that has caused a, a broken leg for our winger, George Saunders, which is obviously tremendously unfortunate and disappointing for him. We then pressed home our advantage and the latter stages were quite comfortable. It wasn't a great game, though, but at the same time, We'll be happy to have got a clean sheet after our recent form. So, yeah, pleased. Indeed, and obviously into the last eight, and who knows what can happen. Need a market pulling off the shock of the round, but there was almost, almost one of the most historic uh, results in the FA Trophy itself. And I, I'm, of course, referring to Morpeth Town, who went away to York City and were <laughs> 2 0 up at one point. Richard. This we spent a lot of last week's podcast speaking about Kidderminster Harry's in the FA Cup and the, and the heartbreak. I'm sure Morpeth supporters are feeling exactly the same at this at this moment in time. Two 0 up, and it's an 89th minute winner that completes the comeback for York City. Absolutely, they must feel like the world they they want the ground to swallow them up all uh, after that result. You know, two 0 up away at York. I mean, I think a few people probably would have actually predicted. That sort of result, Morp have been doing well this season. They knocked out Boston United in the last round a bit at home. And then going to York City, York not having the greatest of seasons. And you think 2 0 up, you know, you're home and hosed. And then they just get that last minute winner, York. And that's the sign of good teams, you know, getting a last minute winner. And, you know, Morp have go home feeling sick as a parrot. But I mean, I think I put it on Twitter saying that it was my, it was going to be my upset of the round was. More of stunning York, and you know, I was what two minutes away from yeah. calling that one, but hey, oh, we live and learn. Yeah, I did last week when I when I said when I jinxed could have Mister Harry is saying West Ham have a minute to hold on to penalties, and then Jared Bowen popping up, which he's done again to, for my blushes. He he scored again this weekend, so it isn't as much of a as a jinx as as, as I may have first thought. But yeah, more of this. Commiserations for them would have been an incredible result, and, and there were a couple nearly shocks, a couple of, of games that were nearly nearly shocks as well. Tunbridge Angels took Bromley to penalties. They they were three two losers on penalties, so a couple of spot kicks missed there, but but they missed out another red card, quite a few red cards this weekend. Stockport County, we mentioned them earlier on in context of the the National League title race. They squeezed past Chetton, who um 
who have been doing some decent decent stuff this season. A fantastic rise for them, at probably the biggest game in the club's history, and and to go away to Stockport County, National League leaders, I think two hundred or so away supporters made the trip. That's fantastic showing there. Big National League game in this round, Joel. A couple of big National League games in this round, actually. But FC Halifax Town 1, Notts County 2. And like we mentioned there before, Borough would be knocked out by Wrexham. Wrexham 3-0 winners there. Those are two teams, aren't they, probably, including Stockport County and that. So they're probably three teams you're looking at, favourites-wise, for the trophy itself. Certainly. Um, quite how the managers will balance league and trophy as we get into the advanced weeks of the season remains to be seen I think a few week, a few um, years ago sorry Lincoln when they had their FA Cup season where they obviously lifted the National League title at the end of it they were in the um, semi-finals of the FA Trophy I believe and they actually made quite a few changes to that game which gives you an indication of what their mindset was so quite whether um, teams do the same or do similar, or it's kind of low on their priority list, remains to be seen. But certainly, all them teams will think that they can get to Wembley and see it as an opportunity to to earn silverware for sure. And, and why shouldn't they? We're at the stage of the competition where you can't afford not to take it seriously now because we're in the, the quarterfinals after this round. So every team in there will be looking quite optimistically to um to the Wembley Arch and dreaming of a potential day out, and, and so they should. It's interesting you bring that up because I, I think definitely in that list, one manager who has, his track record has shown that he takes his competition very seriously is Dave Challoner of Stockport County, and obviously he won the competition with Fylde in 2018-19. The, it was a strange situation when they went to Wembley the week before for the playoff final and, and were unfortunate to to have lost to Salford. Salford doing the 3-0 victory there and then they had to go back the week later. I think it was late in Orient they potentially played in that in that final. I may, I may, have, got, may have got that wrong, but I think it was late in Orient, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, it was, yeah. Yeah, so so they went back and, and actually sort of got rid of their Wembley Wembley hoodoo from seven days prior. But he's somebody who'll be targeting this competition. Obviously, he wants league title. He wants to sort of get that across the line and be football league club by the end of next season. And look, put it this way, it could be the last time Stockport County ever play in the FA Trophy. So I'm sure he'll be looking at that one as a potential silverware in his first season in charge. In terms of the next round then, uh, Richard, as we've mentioned, Plenty of big National League teams involved. For our giant killers, Needham Market, what sort of tie would you, first of all, uh, consider the dream tie for them? And then second of all, who do you think potentially could be looking at as a as a route into the semi-final? I think a dream tie would be someone like Notts County or Stockport County at home. You know, big away attendance at, at Needham, you know, get the home fans in, it will really capture the imagination of former football league sides coming down. Or maybe Wrexham with the owners and the star quality they've got on field. So that would be the dream tie, a realistic one. Again, it's got to be a home tie. There's so many good teams in the uh, quarterfinals of this year's competition. You know, it's hard to pick an easy draw. I mean, there's no easy draw at this stage in the competition. Any manager will tell you that. But... I think you know, get someone at home, they'll fancy themselves on the day. They saw off Yeovil, they've seen off Dartford. Can they make it a hat trick and see off another big guns? We'll wait and see uh, in the next round. Joel, Needham Market versus Dagenham and Redbridge. What are you saying about that? I certainly wouldn't look forward to it. Um, I've experienced <laughs> a lot in the last few years of us playing teams who we should theoretically um, beat. We lost at home to... Um, Worthing a few years ago, we lost it to Car Sholton, so um, certainly that would be one I didn't look forward to. But they'll probably be hoping for um, for York at home, I imagine. That's probably the most winnable of them, and also from a, a neutral perspective, it guarantees a team from below National League level a place in the semi finals, which I think everyone would want to see. Indeed. It wasn't the only uh, non-league football to take place over the weekend, of course. There's plenty of National League action for those teams involved and some influential National League results as well. 
So, away from the FA Trophy, those who had a good weekend in the National League, you've got to look towards Southend United, who played in that late kickoff live on BT Sport, away to Woking. 3-2 winners in the end. Joel, let's stick with you. Southend are flying at the moment under Kevin Mayer, aren't they? They're just absolutely delightful team to watch, and the results are, are, are matching their performances as well. They're certainly um, on the up. Albeit they've had a generous run of games. I think the only tough team they've played in their run of wins has been Bromley. Um, granted, they won that game as well, so they've shown that they can they can beat top sides as well as um, as well as poor sides. Um, their only defeat in twenty twenty two has been to Dagenham in the Trophy. Just thought I'd slip that one in there. But, <laughs> Throwing that in there straight they're, they're away. They're having a, a very very good run, and they've brought a lot of sensible heads in, like like John Still. Um, who who knows the division and can make sensible recruitment based recommendations? And there's certainly a feeling at Southend that they're on the up and they can really consolidate their place in the National League this season, as many sides have done in the past, and then kick on next year, which is obviously going to be the end goal. Although some will say that they feel they can make the playoffs this time around. It's not too late. Yeah, yeah. Uh, j- just sort of looking where they were when Kevin Meyer came in. Now, he didn't necessarily have the best of times after taking over from Phil Brown earlier in the season. It looked at one point as if they were going to be in the midst of another relegation battle. Now, Shrimpers fans will tell us that it's something they have known all too well over the last two seasons, back-to-back relegations, firstly from League One and then from dropping out of the Football League altogether from League Two. However, dropping out of National League is a completely different prospect and one that they would have almost felt like they were having a bit of imposter syndrome being in that position. They were as low as 21st in November, and then they started to turn results around. Richard, Joel referenced it there in terms of the playoffs this season. They've got the momentum. They're eight points off the top seven as things stand. They're currently in 12, but it's nine league games unbeaten. For your money, do you think Southend are going to be able to bridge the gap or is it too little too late? I think on current form, yes, they will be able to make the playoffs. I think I was just looking before we come on to record at the form table. I think they're only second to Stockport County in the form table, which is fantastic if you're a South End uh, fan. You know where they've come from. You mentioned about being 21st in November. So if they could make the playoffs, it'd be fantastic. And if they could get back into the Football League at the first attempt, that would be even better. And then on the flip side, looking back in November, if they got if they hadn't had the start of the great run they've had and they did slip down into National League South, then it'd been a really tough ask for them to get back up. It took Stockport County quite a few years to get out of National League North. It even They weren't even challenging the first few seasons. They were mid-table, I can remember. And then it was only 2018, 2019, the return of Jim Gannon that's really pushed them back into the National League and put them in the position as where they are. Yes, Jim Gannon isn't manager anymore and they've sacked his successor since, but he's done a real big part. Other teams, Kidderminster, Gateshead, York have struggled, so it'd be massive for stop for South End if they were struggling to stay up. But on the flip side, they're on this great run of form. And as Joel mentioned, they've got John Stilling, they've got Stan Collymore, who is really passionate about South End. I believe he does quite a bit of the scouting. I know he was seen at Surely just before they signed Harry Cardwell. So he's had a big involvement in things. And I'm just going to chuck it out there. That I think Harry Cardwell is the reason why they're doing well. ex Joy player. <laughs> he scored two goals since joining there in about four games and had a bit of an injury. So I think it's all down to Mr. Harry Cardwell that they're doing well, personally. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the one-man band, Harry Cardwell. No, he's doing fantastic. Scored again yeah, on, on Saturday against Woking. Four games in a row that they've won, and it always it always seems as if there's a team who who makes the playoffs, who who go on a mad run towards the end of the season and have the momentum. That's the one thing that you have to look at Southend going in their favour, is that the fact that the the 
apart from Stockport County, they're the informed team in the National League. Just looking at some of the teams above them then, Joel, last point on South End. If they are to make it into the playoffs, we've already mentioned the competitive nature of the National League this season. Somebody's going to have to drop out. At the moment, it's difficult to look past, uh, if, if we take the top three, like we mentioned before, as granted, it's difficult to look past the likes of Bromley, Halifax, Boreham Wood, potentially even Solihull and Wrexham as, as dropping out of there. But below them, Grimsby, Notts County, Torquay, and, and obviously Dagenham and Redbridge themselves, there are big names that they're going to have to sort of see off and take points against if they have any hopes of making it into that top seven. For sure, for sure. The only team I think I would put money on um, dropping out of the top seven who are currently there are probably Solihull. Um, that's only based on the fact that the last few games they've had against teams around them, they've been beaten. Um, so I think Solihull will will struggle to kind of maintain their current position. I don't think Southend will make the playoffs either, to be honest, because a lot of their games recently, they've had Kings Lynn, they've had... Um, They've had Dover, obviously Woking, who who are in rotten form. They've had they've had a lot of poor sides, as I said earlier. Um, granted, they beat Bromley, but let's see how they do when they come up against some stronger kind of competitors at this at this um, level. Because it's easy to, and granted, they've had a great run. Obviously, it's not easy to to rack up that many wins. It's no coincidence, but at the same time. Let's see how they do when they're really tested to capacity. Elsewhere in the fifth tier, then South End obviously three two winners against Woking. But in the three o'clock games, Barnet struggled at, at home to Wealdstone. Dover again, another loss for them. Three one. Both of those games, Torquay United beating Dover. Eastley and Yeovil playing out a goalless draw. Nice for Eastley to stop the rut that they've had in in recent weeks. And then Grimsby showing their quality. You know, one of the rare big teams in the National League in action. Three one winners away. Uh, so at home to Aldershot. We'll drop down a division then and, and slightly touch on the National League North and South, starting with North. It was a big day, Richard, in the title talk. We're looking at the likes of Gateshead, Brackley and Kidderminster, the only ones really in contention now, given the fact that Brackley were able to beat Fylde and Charlie, your your beloved Charlie, suffering a defeat. What did you make of yesterday's National League North action? Well, it's been a bit of a surprising month or so for ARC Fylde. I think before Christmas, they looked like they were going to rob to the title they were unbeaten, had a good run of form, but since Christmas, they've really slipped. They've lost to Chorley, they've lost to Gate. Sorry, they beat Gateshead, but they've lost to Brackley. They just can't seem to find that consistency. I know they've had players out injured, and they're starting to bring them back. Mainly, Chris Neal, Chris Neal, who's a fantastic goalkeeper. He shouldn't be playing at this level. He's a former football league player, and how they've got him and got him for a good few years now is fantastic. I think. It's going to be between, well, it's going to be any one of the three. I think it's going to be Kidderminster who win the league. They're in a right good rich vein of form. I think they've only lost twice since November. One of them was Brackley. The other one was Hereford away right before they played uh, Reading. So it is going to be tough for them. But I think Kidderminster, I think it's five clean sheets in a row now. Uh, Unbeaten as well since that Hereford game. And they'll also have the bounce, the uh, momentum of the FA Cup run to carry them on, like we saw with Lincoln a couple of years ago. If they can just keep winning and just keep doing what they're doing, then I think we could see Kidderminster take the league title. And then I think it's going to be for second and third place. It's going to be between, as we mentioned, Gateshead, who've got a good record at home this season. I think they've only lost twice, a bet to two of the teams in the playoffs. And then Brackley, who've been taking points off their uh, rivals uh, in and around the playoff places. We spoke about Russell Penn after that West Ham game and what his future holds in terms of football. And actually, just a, a day or two after that episode dropped, there was links with the move, a move to the vacant role at Walsall. Now, it's local to him, obviously, in that Midlands region. It looks as if they've, they've, they've gone elsewhere, but... It seems, doesn't it, that 
a big job is around the corner for Russell Penn and, and, and you're you're going for Kidderminster for the title that the seven points behind Gateshead as things stand, but two games in hand. Winning those games in hand, as we've seen in the National League, as we've seen in seasons before, isn't always the easiest task, is it, Richard? And you 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 worry for Kidderminster, don't you? We've said it before. If they lose the players and they lose the manager, it's not going to be down to anything other than the fact that they don't get promoted. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a massive opportunity for Kiddy to get promoted. Otherwise, they're going to lose the players. They've got the likes of uh, Sterling, uh, Amari Morgan Smith, Sam Austin. These are big players and clubs are good. National League clubs and League Two clubs are just going to be looking, going, can we get him? You know, can we learn? I mean, obviously, Kidderminster are full time, but particularly for football league clubs, can we dangle that carrot of playing football league? Can we just get them just to bite and sign them up? And you lose one, another player will go, and then it will all unravel. You only need to look at Gloucester last season. Now, Gloucester were flying at the top of the National League North. Season got curtailed around this time last year, it was. And now they're struggling to stay in the National League North. I think it's only one or is it two teams that go down this season from step two? Yeah, just the one. Is it just the one now? Yeah. And I think that is, you know, I mean, it probably won't happen to Kidderminster, a Gloucester situation, but there is always that threat of that happening. You know, teams are going to strengthen, York will strengthen, next season filed if they don't go up they've got money to chuck at it and then the other teams who don't go up surely are always there Brackley have been in the playoffs for about the last four or five seasons each year so I really think Kidderminster need to push on now if they want to get back into the National League this is probably going to be the best time to do it because of the momentum they've got from the FA Cup run and the windfall if they need to bring in players they can bring in players with that money 100%, 100%. 100%, 100%. You mentioned Gloucester City there. It looks as if they're probably going to stay clear of relegation. They got a massive victory against Farsley Celtic at the weekend. They were they were 2-1 winners there away to Farsley. Now, Farsley bottom, it looks as if they're going to drop out. Telford there as well, just a one point separates them. So it's going to be interesting to watch what unfolds in the National League North. But making the journey down the M6, and into southern England. Joel, a similar situation is unfolding at the top of the National League South. It seemed as if there has been a number of clubs who were in pole position to run away with the National League South title. Yet, it's the gap has closed, and it looks now as if Dorking, Maidstone, potentially even Oxford City, and who knows, even Dartford as well, could be embro- embroiled in a fantastic title race. I'm just looking at some of the form now. It's green win. Uh, numbers across the board for the, these teams at the top. Dorkin winners yesterday after disappointing defeat away to Tunbridge the, season, uh, the, the weekend before. Maidstone as well, they picked up three points, extending their winning run to four games. Is it between Dorkin and Maidstone or can the likes of Oxford City and Dartford, like I mentioned, bridge the gap even further and turn it into a four-horse race? It's, it's hard to say. It's certainly very difficult to say when there's so many twists and turns each weekend and if we discuss it next weekend, it will be entirely different as well because someone like Oxford City will probably go and lose 2-0 somewhere and then all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, well, are Dorkin and Maidstone pulling away and then Dorkin could get beat. It's just that sort of division. (laughs) This week, Dorkin had a great result, um, winning 2-0 at Bath City, especially after... um, Suffering defeat the previous weekend, this was a real test of their metal, test of their um, their resolve, and how quickly they could get back to winning ways. And they've answered any doubts emphatically because all of a sudden they're they're back on it, they're back on course. Maidstone as well, um, three two winners, hat trick from Jack Barham, so they're going to fancy themselves. They're three points behind Dorkin as long as they keep winning, even if Dorkin win, they're within touching distance, so they know that when they meet at Meadowbank in a couple of weeks' time, the stakes are very, very high for that one. I don't want to write off Oxford City, but at the minute it's hard to look beneath that top four. I mean, obviously counting Dartford because they didn't play uh, National League South this weekend. They were in the FA Trophy. But especially with Ebbsfleet's defeat, at the minute you've got to say the top four, the winner of the division will come from those. 
slightly further down the table then, Eastbourne Borough were the team who were beaten by Maidstone at the weekend. Now, they slipped into a real battle with three or four teams to sort of get into the playoffs. If we look at the top of the table, it looks as if Dorking, Maidstone, Oxford City, Dartford and probably even Ebbsfleet are going to be the, the mainstays in the playoff. And then below them, Eastbourne Borough, Chippenham, Dulwich Hamlet, St Albans and potentially even Hungerford Town could be the the rest of the makeup inside that top seven. Who are you looking at there as potentially the ones with the momentum to go on and secure a top seven place? Because actually, all those teams that I mentioned down until Hungerford, who drew, all of them lost. So it looks as if nobody really wants to take that those two sort of playoff spaces that are available. Yeah, you're right. Um, looking at some of the teams, Dulwich Hamlet, who are just on the cusp of the playoffs, they've lost to Billericay Town, which no one would have seen coming. And then you look at St Albans just below them, They've had a horrendous week. They've lost 5 0 at Ebbsfleet. And then yesterday, um, they suffered a, a narrow defeat at home to Braintree Town. So, a lot of teams, nobody's really taking authority and really making a commanding stride into those playoffs. It seems like the playoff battle could be which team kind of racks up fewer defeats rather than which team manages to get those wins together. Eastbourne. Obviously, yesterday's result to Maidstone, you can excuse it because Maidstone are a very good side and their form before that was generally quite good. So I think Eastbourne will make the playoffs. They're, um, they've, they've had a decent season. And then Chippenham as well. Not many defeats for them. Um, but then you look at their result at Welling United, who are also down there. And all of a sudden, you see a picture emerging whereby a lot of teams who are supposedly the top teams in that division are liable to get beat on any given week. And that's why what makes it such a fascinating division along the, alongside the North and, and the premier side of the national league. Contrasting situations with the North where it seems as though six or seven teams can't lose a game. Whereas in the national league South, it seems as though six or seven teams can't win a game, but we'll wait and see ever fascinating situations at this time of year and we'll wait and see but and it's an issue that won't go away in between now and our next podcast but that will do for today on this week's episode of the non-league weekly if you can hit follow and subscribe on whichever podcast platform you are listening to us on and if you could also leave a review that would be superb it helps us bump up the ratings and get out to as many ears as possible but no guys thank you very much for joining me joel it's been a pleasure richard it's been a pleasure we'll be back again next week to discuss all the latest news and incidents from the world of non-league